Darwin left the trip with the idea that species could change, even though the prevailing thought was that species were fixed, um, as in they never changed. And he just, he thought that this change would happen over a long amount of time. He had observed the geology around South America and, you know, everything he was learning from the geological books he had and what he was seeing said that the earth was very, very old. And so that provided lots and lots of time for species to change. And he proposed a method for that change that he called natural selection. And he derived that term from an existing term that was artificial selection. And artificial selection is a really fun thing to discuss. It was in fashion at the time, um, you know, in the early 1800s, to breed the common rock pigeon, so there it is, by artificially selecting individuals with desired traits and interbreeding them into some really wild combinations. So here's one with the really, really huge um, foot feathers and a different coloration. Um, people still do this, of course, with dogs and livestock, but they actually still breed pr pigeons. Um, on the same pigeonmad.com website, I found a number of other common um, breeds. You can see the fancy pigeon here with the neck feathers that surround its head. Clearly not something that nature would really, you know select four you need to be able to see. I doubt this pigeon can see very well. Um, you got the fancy swirled feather pigeon. Um, this is, I think, a trumpeting pigeon, but also has some interesting coloration and feathers there. And the classic fantail pigeon. So, some crazy stuff going along with artificial selection. I always love to take a look at the pigeons. So jumping back into natural selection from artificial selection, if man could artificially select for crazy traits, Darwin didn't think it was an incredible leap to think that nature could also. So he borrowed some ideas from Thomas Malthus, which was this idea that populations grew exponentially, but resources do not, and so there is some limit that creates a struggle for survival, that populations produce more offspring than the environment can support. And so you might see something like birds reproducing at an exponential rate. They have, you know, three or four young at a time, which is much more than they need to simply replace the two parents. But we don't see exponential growth because only some of those offspring survive. Darwin noticed that the offspring that are produced are different from each other so that there's natural variation in populations and some variations will be better suited to the environment at the time. That gives you a measure of the individual's fitness as in survival of the fittest and variation that increases your odds of survival are called adaptations. So variation can be neutral um, you know, differences in color may not affect your odds of survival, but when we're talking about adaptations, we're talking about those things that are beneficial. So if there are too many offspring and some are more fit than others because they have more adaptations, then some are going to be more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on those characteristics. And that leads to something that is sometimes used interchangeably with natural selection, and that is descent with modification, as in your descendants, your offspring, will be like you, but slightly modified. They're, they will contain more of the adaptations that the parent generation had and fewer of those non-adaptive traits. A common misconception about adaptations um, is that you can accumulate characteristics during your lifetime that you can pass on to your offspring. We talked about this a little bit in genetics, but when we're talking about evolution especially, we're talking about variation that must be heritable. That is, phenotypes that are based on genotypes, and those genes can be passed on. So becoming stronger through hard work is not necessarily something you can pass on. But having resistance to malaria because of a heterozygous sickle cell trait 
is something you can pass on. And that's an example of an adaptation. And it's not necessarily adaptive everywhere. So here's an example. So you've got your three different genotypes for sickle cell. So homozygous dominant, you don't have sickle cell trait um, or sickle cell disease, but you also don't have resistance to malaria. As a heterozygote, you have what's called sickle cell trait. So you don't have the disease or disorder, but you do have resistance to malaria. And of course, homozygous recessive does give you the disease or the disorder. And so that in and of itself is going to be less adaptive because you will not survive as long or be able to reproduce as much um, or at least over as many years as the dominant individuals will. So you see that higher frequencies of the sickle cell allele are in places where there's a high risk of encountering malaria because the gene, the, the recessive allele, gives you an advantage in that situation. But in places where there is much less malaria, then it's less beneficial to have that recessive allele because you can still end up having two heterozygous parents that have an offspring with the homozygous recessive trait, and that is not so helpful. So allele frequencies will change based on the situation in that environment. And there will always be natural selection because the environment constantly changes and there are new gene mutations springing up all the time. So you can, we'll look at mutations in just a second, but you take that with all the variation that you're getting from sexual reproduction and you shuffle those adaptive odds even more with each offspring getting half the alleles of each parent. So some individuals might get, you know, quote unquote lucky and get a lot of adaptive alleles while others might get fewer than either of their parents had. Um, so there's some chance involved with sexual reproduction as well. So looking at mutations and natural selection, you can see that not all mutations are beneficial. So here you've got your non-beneficial or your lethal mutations. Um, so those do not live to the next set of generations, but a new lethal mutation arises. Um, and then you have, in those later generations, you can see that as, there are more beneficial mutations. Um, or at least the frequency of beneficial mutations to normal gene has increased because at the beginning it was one out of every seven and now it's one out of three. So you're changing the allele frequencies over time. That's you know the big take home message from this set of screencasts, change in allele frequencies through natural selection and mutation. One more way to look at that um, we have this notion often that natural selection is like just this gradual set of changes, often because that's what we see in the fossil record. But what is really going on is you have non-random survival. What non-random survival is, is natural selection. And so natural selection eliminates some of the less adapted individuals, but as those individuals reproduce, oh, let's back up, you're going to have mutation again, and so that's going to give you some new variation for natural selection to act on. So more non-random survival, then more mutation, then more natural selection, and so over generations of added mutations plus natural selection, that's how you get your gradual change to a very different population than you started with.